The results are in for hundreds of thousands of A-level students. The number getting top grades has gone up, but so too has the attainment gap between those attending private and state schools. There are big gaps that have opened up and, and are widening where it comes to outcomes for students from places like the North East compared to, say, London. I'm determined to turn that around. Also, the lunchtime recession recovery. The UK economy grows by 0.6%. The Environment Agency investigates the company behind the cyanide canal spillage in Warsaw. Could you be due for a rail fine refund, a test case in court and... My name is Taylor and welcome to the Eras Tour. She's back. Taylor Swift returns after her cancelled gigs at this time at Wembley. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Lucrezia Millerini. Good afternoon. A-level results are out and the top grades are on the rise. Hundreds of thousands of students in England, Wales and Northern Ireland woke up to their exam results this morning. More than a quarter achieved A's and A-stars, slightly up on last year. And that figure is still higher than the levels seen in 2019, the last set of exams before COVID disruption. Well, this year's overall pass rate has so seen a small fall, but for more than 425,000 school pupils, a place at college or university awaits. We'll be live at one uni's call centre shortly and have analysis about disparities across the country. But first, here's Aisha Zahid on the results and the reactions. <laughs> the wait is over. Across the country, students finally have their results and there's plenty to celebrate. I've done well. I've done really well, actually. I'm very happy with what I've achieved. It all, all my hard work paid off, I'm very happy, you know. It's really relieving because I got a scholarship at Royal Holloway, like, so I'm really happy that I get to fulfil it. I got the grades I needed to get into uni, so I'm, I'm happy enough with that. Um, it'll, it'll do for now. <laughs> Results were expected to be lower because of exam boards following pre-pandemic processes in their marking, though despite this, there's been a rise in students achieving top grades, with more than a quarter being awarded an A or A star, up slightly on last year and pre-pandemic levels. Over 425,000 students have gained a place at university or college. That's a 3% increase from last year. And UCAS said 82% of all applicants gained a place at their first choice, which is up 79% from last year. But university isn't the plan for everyone. And that's a trend they've been seeing more and more at this college in Leeds. We're seeing a high number of our T-level students moving either directly into employment or moving into an apprenticeship. So that's shifted the balance slightly. For our A-level students, again, we're seeing more progress into apprenticeships. It's been a long way, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. With today's results, worries around widening attainment gaps grow, especially between state and private schools and regional disparities. I'm determined to turn that around. That means driving high and rising standards in our schools and more teachers there to support our young people. But alongside that, we have to respond to the wider pressures that families are under at the moment. And that's why taking action on child poverty in particular is so important. For now, it's a sigh of relief for most of these students as they start getting ready for the next steps. Aisha Zahid, ITV News. As we've heard, today's figures reveal a widening gap in attainment between private and state school pupils. But UCAS, the admission services, a record number of disadvantaged students have gained university places this year. Our social affairs correspondent Sarah Corker is at York St John University. And Sarah, such a big day for so many. But when it comes to those results, uh, what's the big picture? 
Well, actually, the majority of students got their first choice universities today. But as you say there, there is growing concern about the attainment gap, and not just between state and private schools, but also the north-south divide. Now, in the northeast, for example, 25% of students secured a university place today, but that is compared to 42% in London. And that gap has widened over the last five years. Uh, but there are plenty of options for students, as you say. We're at York St. John uh, University today, the Clearing Centre. Phone lines opened at 8. It's been very busy. Matthew is in charge of admissions here. What's demand been like this year? Uh, demand's been really good. We've had a really good morning so far. Lots of calls, we've made lots of offers and we've been able to support people through the process. And who is it that comes through Clearing? Because it's, it's a different student this year, isn't it? Maybe not so much this year, but over the past few years there's been a change. It used to be that Clearing was mainly for students who hadn't got in at their first choice places, but now there's quite a mix of people who change their mind and want to go to a different university, or um, people who just apply direct into Clearing without going through the main bit of UCAS. Okay. We know that universities are facing financial pressures. What's the demand like trying to fill places? Because fewer international students mean there are more places this year. Yeah, the, uh, the competition for applicants is quite fierce this year. Um, for York St John, our domestic numbers are good. And also, I'm really happy to, to say that our international numbers seem uh, to be building to a really good state as well. And that is one of the main worries for quite a lot of universities. OK, Matthew, thank you for those insights there. Well, it's been really busy. You just see on the screen here, hundreds of calls have already been taken today, many more over the weeks ahead. And there are actually 30,000 degree courses in the clearing system, including medicine and law. Big decisions ahead for thousands of students today. Yes, indeed. What's there at York St John University? Thank you. Well, there was more good news on the economy today with the latest figures showing continued growth between April and June. GDP increased by 0.6%. It's largely thanks to improvements in the service sector. The Conservatives claim that shows they left the economy in a better state than Labour admits, but the government insists there is still much more work to do. Our political correspondent, Shihab Khan, reports. After a while of the economy barely growing, things are slowly starting to heat up. Kareem Ullah owns this restaurant in Stansted, and he says an improving economy is a key ingredient for success in his business. Things are looking so much better. We are seeing people um, come more frequently now, and they are actually um, spending more because um, for a period um, in 2022, beginning of 2023, we saw people cut back. And things do seem to have turned. Figures from the ONS show that the economy grew by 0.6% between April and June this year, while in the previous quarter, this was at 0.7%, meaning so far in 2024, the UK economy has grown faster than any of our G7 counterparts. This is significantly better than the second half of last year, where two consecutive quarters of negative growth meant the economy was technically in a recession. While the government welcomed the news, they remained cautious about the state of the country's finances. What we inherited from the Conservatives was the worst fiscal inheritance since the Second World War. And that means we are very challenging economic circumstances. We welcome growth in the economy and growth is our first and most important mission here at the Treasury. But we've got much, much more work to do to recover from the mess that we were left with. That is a charge the Conservatives disagree with. With the economy growing and inflation figures stabilising around 2%, they say they've left things in a good state. These are really positive GDP figures this morning, but the only person who's not out celebrating them is the Chancellor. You know, Rachel Reeves is sitting in the Treasury fuming because this is yet more data to undermine her narrative that the economic inheritance was bad. And she can no longer use that as a pretext for the tax rises that she was planning all along. Nonetheless, it is good news for the government, especially as the Chancellor will be relying on good growth figures as she prepares for her October budget. Chihab Khan, ITV News, Westminster. They say they have submitted to prosecutors a comprehensive file after last month's incident at Manchester Airport. Three officers were injured and a man was seen to have his head stamped on in a video that circulated online. It prompted an investigation by the Independent Office for Police Conduct. 
And the government has announced more than £13 million in support for workers and businesses affected by changes at Port Talbot Steel Plant. Job losses are expected as Tata switches to a greener form of production. The latest report into Britain's biggest police force has found it is failing in almost all areas. His Majesty's Inspectorate, the watchdog for the emergency services, says the Met Police is inadequate at investigating crime and the report identified problems with its handling of officers. Well, Antoine Allen is at the Met's headquarters this lunchtime. Antoine, why has this come out now? Well, the nation's biggest police force has faced years of scandals. This latest report looks at the efforts from new leadership to try and raise standards, but it doesn't paint a pretty picture of fast enough change. Out of the nine areas where the Met was assessed, they were deemed as below standards in eight. They were graded as requires improvement or inadequate, including investigating and preventing crime. And the part of the Met's job is not simply just policing events or arresting people on the street. They have to check in on registered sex offenders. The report gives one example of a high-risk registered sex offender who hadn't received a successful visit from an officer or team member since 2017. It also goes on to say that too many sexual predators were given prior warning before their visits. That could have given them a chance to destroy a laptop or to get images off a mobile phone. They also state that it goes against the Met's actual guidelines. Now, the report does go and state that the Met are improving in some areas, but they say that it's inconsistent. The Met also are praised for their use of stop and search. Now, two years ago, the Met hired Sir Mark Rowley in order to raise those standards. Uh, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan has said that he agrees with the findings of the report, but he still believes Sir Mark Rowley will be able to turn things around. We did have a statement from the Met where they said that we're using every available resource to deliver more trust, less crime and high standards. The question is, can the public wait for those standards to raise high enough? Yeah, Antoine, in central London, thank you. The company behind a toxic chemical spill in a Warsaw Canal is being investigated by the Environment Agency. Metalwork firm Anachrome admitted last night that it was responsible, saying it was regrettable that chemicals had entered the water. Well, our Midlands correspondent Ben Chapman is at the canal for us. And Ben, what's the impact there? Well, the most immediate impact has been to anyone who might want to use this canal or its towpaths. It's part of 12 miles of canals that have been closed since this spill in the early hours of Monday morning. And you don't have to look very hard in the water to see the environmental impact. Hundreds of dead fish floating on the surface after it was confirmed that sodium cyanide was the chemical released into the water and that is every bit as nasty as it sounds. Toxic to marine life, dangerous to birds, even potentially fatal to humans if ingested. It's used in industry for metal cleaning and plating. And now a surface coatings company called Anachrome has admitted it was responsible for the spill. They're based just a hundred yards or so from the canal and said that it was regrettable. It said it notified the Environment Agency as soon as it happened and was now focused on working with the authorities here to limit the impact. The safety of our community and the environment is our top priority, it said. Now, the Environment Agency has described the spill as unacceptable, said that there will be serious, strong action if wrongdoing is found, but the unanswered questions that remain are just how on earth was this allowed to happen and how long will it be before this canal is safe again? All right, Benny Warsaw, thank you. Still ahead on the lunchtime news. Null and void why thousands of prosecutions for alleged fare evasion should never have been brought by train companies. First, tech firms are failing to detect and remove dangerous online content about suicide and self-harm. That is according to a new study which analysed more than 12 million moderations. It found of all self-harm content removed on social media, Instagram and Facebook were each responsible for just 1%. And X 
formerly known as Twitter, was responsible for just one in 700 dangerous posts. Well, over 95 of such posts were detected by rival platforms Pinterest, Pinterest and TikTok. The study was conducted by the Molly Rose Foundation, founded in memory of Molly Russell, who took her own life after viewing harmful content online. And the charity's chief executive, Andy Burrows, uh, joins us now. Andy, thanks so much for talking to us. It's lunchtime. Clearly, more needs to be done when it comes to this kind of uh, content online. Um, what is the foundation most concerned about there? Well, we are really shocked by these findings because it really demonstrates that with the exception of Pinterest and TikTok, some of the largest social media platforms really are failing to detect and then remove uh, harmful and dangerous content. Uh, the proportions uh, that Meta's platforms, that X's platforms, as you said in the introduction, uh, are identifying and taking down are a drop in the ocean when we look at how high risk those platforms are and how easily it is for children and for teenagers to not only access that content, but then to be algorithmically bombarded with these types of posts. So this is a clear sign that self-regulation has failed and we need to see really now very, very strong measures being put on these failing tech companies. Um, Andy, um, Molly sadly died nearly seven years ago. And, you know, tech seems to be this huge, fast-changing universe. There is so much content out there. First of all, why are some platforms quicker than others at removing harmful content? And also, you know, what can parents do? How can they guard their children's safety? Well, this is simply a matter of investment. The fact that we can see some platforms identifying millions of pieces of content, that shows that this can be done. It's technically possible. So this is a choice from those platforms that are failing not to invest in child safety and in protecting children's uh, well-being when using these sites. Um, you're right, parents will be really concerned by these findings. Um, my advice to parents watching this, it's very simple. Have regular conversations with your child. It's really important that if your teenager is on one of these platforms, accesses this type of content, it's upsetting, it has effects on them, they know that they can come and talk to you. So you can then work through that together. And finally, Andy, we know that there is the Online Safety Act, but should the new government be doing more? We absolutely need to see this new government commit to strengthen the Online Safety Act. Uh, what we're now seeing from the regulator, Ofcom, is how they are intending to enforce the Online Safety Act. And it's very, very clear that that will not go far enough. If platforms are not identifying this content, as our research really shows today, then so much of what else Ofcom is proposing, for example, making sure that platforms can't algorithmically recommend self-harm oh. content to users, falls apart. OK, Andy Burrows, thank you so much for talking to us lunchtime. And thank just you. to say that all these social media companies say that they are working hard to clamp down on harmful material on their site. And you can read more and access support on our website, itv.com slash news. Next, thousands of prosecutions into alleged train fare evasion could be declared void. A judge has been looking into six test cases and says the way they were brought by rail companies should not have happened. Our reporter Will Tallis is here. And uh, while this is pretty complicated, but in short, it opens the door to not just six people, uh, but many more people having their cases quashed. Yeah, so let's just unpack this, Lucrezia. Essentially, since 2016, around 75,000 alleged rail fare dodgers have been prosecuted by train companies under a controversial system known as the Single Justice Procedure, or SJP, essentially. Under the SJP, cases are decided behind closed doors, often with a single magistrate and without the defendant even appearing in court. Well, today, all of these rail fare prosecutions are set to be declared void after a judge ruled they should never have been brought through the SJP process in the first place. Well, this follows, as you say, six test cases which were heard in court last month that centred around convictions secured by Greater Anglia and Northern Rail. Northern has today said it will now work with the court to implement today's findings and Greater Anglia has said it stopped progressing cases under the SJP back in March and is reviewing previous cases. Well, Lucrezia, one passenger who was prosecuted by Northern Rail was at court today. Here's what he had to say. All these convictions are going to be declared a nullity. That is as if they've never happened. All the fines and costs will be repaid by the chain companies and to the defendants who paid their fines. Um, but I think there's further questions. How did 75,000 unlawful convictions get rubber stamped by the criminal courts? 
So the Department for Transport's now responded to the ruling. They said today, we acknowledge the chief magistrate's judgment and welcome the apology from train operators. While fare evasion should be tackled, the right process should be followed at all times. So Lucrezia, justice for some of those passengers who are wrongfully prosecuted, but for many questions remain over how this was allowed to get to this stage in the first place. Mm, all right, Will, thank you. Some other news now. More than 40,000 Palestinians have been killed in the Israel-Hamas war since fighting began last October. That is according to Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry. A new round of ceasefire talks is due to play, play, take place in Doha today, involving officials from Israel, Qatar, the US and Egypt. More than half of all homes and businesses in Puerto Rico have been left without power following the arrival of Storm Ernesto. It's now heading north towards Bermuda, with forecasters predicting it could become a major hurricane in the next 48 hours. And the American actor Gina Rowlands has died at the age of 94. Famous for her roles in films such as Gloria and The Notebook, she won numerous Emmy Awards, Golden Globes and was nominated for an Oscar twice. And finally, this lunchtime, Taylor Swift is bringing the European leg of her record-breaking Eras tour to a close with the last string of shows in the UK starting tonight. It's after the singer was forced to axe concerts in Vienna following a foiled terror plot. Well, Sharon Thomas has been at Wembley Stadium for us this lunchtime. Absolutely, they're taking no chances here at Wembley. They're saying here, the organisers, much as you might love her, if you are a ticketless Taylor fan, please do stay away. They don't want any tailgating. Of course, that's what it's called, because last time when she was here in June, we saw crowds of people arriving here hours early and literally taking over the, the whole place. So from a security point of view, they're saying no overnight camping, don't think about getting here early to secure a spot. They're also saying no large bags and no laptops. Having said all of that, what a party it's going to be. Taylor has covered 152 gigs over five continents on this era's tour and is due to make around £2 billion in ticket sales alone. The doors here open in about two hours' time. The show is due to start at five o'clock. The atmosphere here is absolutely fantastic. Everybody is so excited. They all say they've waited a long time for this. And I'm feeling pretty underdressed, actually, all around me. All I can see is sequins and satin and silver boots. So uh, I think all I need now is a ticket, albeit some of them are £800 for tonight. Wow, Sharon Thomas reporting there at Wembley Stadium. And that is it for now. The evening news is at 6.30. But from everyone on the lunchtime team, bye-bye.